Our first presentation is going to be in, Engl in English, uh, and it's by Aral Balkan. He's a person who's trying to make the world and the internet a better place. He's the founder and designer of Indy, which brings us the Ethical Design Manifesto, which helps us care about human rights in this modern world and hopefully succeeds. And he's also a really meticulous guy who pays really good attention to detail. Uh, he basically arranged the entire stage himself. So uh, please give a warm welcome to our Al Balkan. So, you know, we got both of those right now. That's great. All right. And uh, can we have some visuals? We love seams, don't we, in our community? We love seams because seams show us how things work, right? When a microphone doesn't work, um, we think, why? Is it muted? Is it off? Our analytical brains start working. It's great, isn't it? Because we love that sort of thing. And when the projector isn't on, we're thinking, ah, is it a problem with the video signal that goes into the first uh, signal booster here? Or is it the problem from there into the HDMI to SDI? We love those terms, don't we? Because when things, when things have seams, it gives us a chance to play with them, right? It, it gives us a chance to open them up and look inside them and see how they work. And for us as enthusiasts, this is a beautiful thing, isn't it? We love it. We could spend a whole weekend doing this and debugging why something didn't work. Un Can I do what? Yeah, we're going to debug this now. So I'm going to see if I'm sending a signal. All right, so let's do this. All right. So I'm pressing escape to get out of the uh, presentation. And uh, it's not letting me. There we go. That's great. Let's go into preferences. This is all riveting stuff, by the way. I'm sure you're enjoying it. Um, and then um, we're going to gather the windows. Yep, they're all here. I can see the Samsung screen. This is beautiful. Um, I can see the display. Um, yeah, I am sending a signal is the answer to your question. So let's go back to this. Is this all connected? Yeah, so debugging and seams and creating things by, you know, kind of like the incredible machine, putting them all together are things we love to do. What it doesn't create, unfortunately, is a great seamless experience, right? The focus is on the technology. So right now, you're not thinking about my presentation. You're not thinking about the messages that I want to give you. You're thinking about the mechanism by which I communicate with you. You're thinking about the tools. You're thinking about everything that could be used to create a beautiful, seamless experience, you are dissecting it. You are thinking about all of the various pieces. The magic doesn't exist. We will regain the magic when the projector starts. But it's very important that we understand this because we're guilty of this in the products that we make as well. A big part of my talk will be about this, about how if we want to build everyday things for people, if we want to build things that people use without knowing how they work, because think about it, when you get in your car and you drive to work or you drive to the grocery store, do you necessarily think about the engine? Do you necessarily think about the gears? Do you necessarily think about how everything is working? Do you stop halfway to the market, get out of your car, and make your engine work a bit better, and then go? No. But we do this with technology every day. So for example here, to give you a great example, we had this working. Um, we came because we really care about the experience that we're going to give to you, right? Because your time matters. It's not because we want to put on a great show. It's not because I want to come out here and be like a rock star. It's because I respect your time. It's because I respect your experience. Because if you think about it, the things that we have the least of in this world are our experiences, right? Our lives are a string of experiences, whether it's in the real world, like here today with me, 
or whether it's with computers, or whether it's with your phone, when you're having an experience, you're spending time that you will never get back. And then you die at some point. So experiences matter. And the reason that we have to focus on building things that don't just work, especially don't just work for us, but are great experiences for other people, is not because we want to show off, not because we want to be seen as rock stars, but because we respect people's experiences. We respect, fundamentally, their lives. And I, and I think this is a beautiful way of making that point. So I'm, I'm really glad the projector is not working. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> it's working, but it's not connecting. OK, great. See, that's great to know. But for someone sitting in the audience, it's just not working. <laughs> It could be not working for many amazing reasons, <laughs> for, for things that are very interesting, that maybe we could write a paper on. But for you sitting in those seats, it's just not working. And it's the same with, with software and with the things that we build. If something doesn't work, we love to take it apart and find out why. But for someone who needs that to work, for them to do what they need to do, it just doesn't work. <laughs> And we need to start building things that just work. So we are still debugging this, uh, this projector here. Contraption. OK, I can say contraption. I've been allowed to. Um, so how's it going, guys? This is the tech crew up there, by the way. Say hi. <laughs> They're working hard. They are working hard. And you know that everyone here volunteers, and everyone here um, works very hard to bring you this event as a free event as well. And as someone who's produced these events, I know how difficult that is. So please do, do give them another round of applause. They are, they are trying very hard. And don't worry, because I was thinking of going a little short anyway. So we're just, you know, we're covering more stuff. How you guys doing? Yeah? <laughs> Thank you so much for getting up so early to come here, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're glad it's paying off. Uh, <laughs> hey, we got, a, we got a string quartet doing smoke on the water. You don't see that every day. Um, so yeah, there you go. It's not very ergonomic either, the setup, so I hope. Let's see how this goes. Ah, the screen has flickered. That's a good sign. Um, has your screens flickered up there as well? Is there, there's no flickering? Yes, there's, there's been flickering. We have flickering in the balcony. Thank you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you for your help. All right. How fitting a title, wouldn't you say? The tyranny of everyday things like projectors, or like teddy bears. So this is US patent number 201-501-38333. It is a patent by Google for a teddy bear. A teddy bear with microphones and cameras that listens to the what your kids are doing, that looks at what, how your kids are playing with them and learns about them and is a friend to them. Isn't this a lovely teddy bear? Um, Google hasn't actually built this yet. This is just the patent. But Barbie are releasing a doll this month, it's scheduled for this month to be released, that does listen to your child and learns about your child and speaks back to your child. And one of the voice actors was quoted in an article saying, I imagined a girl taking the new doll into her bedroom and closing the door. I have no doubt she will ask Barbie all manner of those intimate questions that she wouldn't ask an adult. Which sounds lovely and creepy as fuck. <laughs> when you think about the fact that when she's speaking to Barbie, she's speaking to Toy Talk Incorporated. 
Because whenever you say something to Barbie, it's recorded and transmitted to computers that are the property, the servers of Toy Talk, a company, at which point they're analyzed. Now, this is not just for dolls. We live in a world today where our everyday things, our televisions, our smart TVs, the watches that we wear, the fitness trackers that we wear, pretty soon, and even today, the cars that we drive, all of these everyday devices gather personal information about us. They need to get to understand us and know us in order to be useful to us. Now, this by itself is not the problem. This is just a fact of life. This is how technology, modern technology works. And there's not anything necessarily wrong with this so far, okay, with what we have so far. Now, here's where it gets more complicated. We have all of this information, all of this personal information, this data. If this data is owned and controlled by individuals, there's nothing wrong. Then we have a democracy. Things are fine. If this data is owned and controlled by corporations, and then by extension, of course, made accessible to governments, then we have a very different system. We have what's known as a corporatocracy. Now, this is not a decision that we need to make. We don't need to decide whether our data should be owned by individuals or our data should be owned by corporations. Because unfortunately, this is a decision we made 10, 20 years ago. In the reality of today, we live in a corporatocracy where our data is owned and controlled by corporations and by extension accessible to governments. The decision that we need to make is, are we happy with this? If we're not happy with this, what kind of a path forward, not back, do we need to walk on to get towards a more democratic system? Because we're here right now. And the problem is not a technology problem. This is really important for us to understand because we see things always as technology problems. It's not. The problem at its core is a capitalism problem. We don't have a technology problem. We have a capitalism problem. Specifically, what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. Let me explain why because the link may not be very clear immediately. We live in a world where 85 is a very important number. 85. Last year, Oxfam, a charity in the UK, released a report which had a very startling statistic in it, that 85 of the world's richest people have as much wealth as half of the world's poorest population combined. So 85 people have as much wealth as 3.5 billion people in the world today. Now, 85 is a number that is under the Dunbar number. We can visualize it. It looks like this. That's 85. 85 people will fit into one double-decker bus in London. Now, I want you to visualize 3.5 billion people. You can't. Our brains are not wired that way. And that is the best illustration I know of systemic inequality. So if we have a system with such inequality, and if you're one of those 85 people, what should you do, right? Because it's probably quite a hostile world out there if you're one of the 85. I would recommend that you build very thick, very tall walls around you, just for defense, you know? Because some people might want what you have. There's a whole bunch of people out there. And if you've built these walls around you, it's probably a good idea to keep an eye on those 3.5 billion, right? They might be up to no good. And maybe we'll, we'll be all right with that. I mean, if you think about it, most of us are all right with the concept of an all-seeing, all-knowing white guy that lives on a cloud. 
maybe we'll be all right with the concept of another, maybe less magical, all-seeing white guy that lives on a cloud. I don't know. Why not, right? Of course, the cloud is not the solution. The cloud is the problem. And mostly because there is no cloud. As the Free Software Foundation says, there are only other people's computers. And we put these computers into what we call server farms, right? Great term, server farms. Have you ever asked yourselves what's being farmed? Because you might reach the conclusion that it's us. When you think about the business models of Facebook and Google, what are they farming? They're farming us. Now, in the past, and unfortunately still today in some places, we had, uh, and we still have, a terrible practice of selling people's bodies. We still do it in the world in places. It's terrible. And we call this slavery. We understand it very well. We understand how slavery works. So we have to ask ourselves, I think we're at a point where we have to ask ourselves the very uncomfortable question as people who work in technology, maybe some of you work at Facebook and Google, maybe you don't. We have to ask ourselves the question, what do we call the business of selling everything else about a person who makes, that makes them who they are apart from their body? We don't care about people's bodies anymore, right? at least in the technology world. I don't want your body, there's not much I can do with it. But if I'm Google or if I'm Facebook or if I'm Snapchat or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I really care about everything else about you. We, we really care about you. How many times do you hear, hear that from, from these companies? They really wanna get to know you, don't they? Why? So they can make money from it, so they can sell that. So what do we call this? I think we have to ask ourselves that. So that is the problem, right? It's quite a depressing place. So we're not gonna leave it there. Let's talk about how we fix this. Let's talk about solutions. And the solutions have to be broad in their approach. They have to be multidisciplinary. This is not something you're gonna solve by building the next you know, great gadget. That's not gonna be enough. The solutions have to be legislative. We have to create new laws that protect our rights. But first of all, we have to understand why that's necessary. We have to understand, you might have heard of data being called the new exhaust. Has anyone heard that? The, the new oil. Have you heard that one? Data is the new oil. How terrible. Because we have to understand that data is people. When we're talking about our personal information, we are, by extension, talking about ourselves. These are not separate things. If I know enough about you, imagine that I know so much about you on a real-time basis that I can create, we call it a profile, let's go further, that I can create a simulation of you. Then I don't need your body, right? I have this simulation that I own that I can put in my lab and I can run tests on 24-7. I can psychoanalyze it, I can see how you're going to behave towards certain stimuli. So we have to understand that when we're talking about data, we're not talking about something that's separate to the person, we're talking about the person. Because that's how we use technology. It's not just today, that's how we've always used technology, to extend our biological selves. We extend our biological capabilities through our technologies. So perhaps it's time to understand that we have to extend person rights to the technologies by which we extend our persons. This is key. We need to create laws then that, that protect that. We already understand that the self should be protected. We just need to draw the boundaries of the self to include our technologies. Because if I write something on my phone, a note that I want to remember. I'm extending myself. And thus, if we extend the boundaries of the self to include that, then any attempt to get at that information, surveillance, 
will be an intrusion on the self. And we already have laws that deal with this. But we have to understand that there is no digital world and real world. That what we're talking about are not digital rights, we're talking about human rights in a digital age. And we as individuals must have ownership and control of our digital selves. The solutions should be regulatory. There are corporations out there that are violating our human rights on a daily basis, purely on the basis of their, their business models. That's how they make money. So why are we not regulating them? Why aren't the people who are tasked with protecting us not protecting us from these corporations? Why are some of them saying, well, we, we, we want to be neutral. You know, we don't want to pass legislation. We don't want to regulate because we'll hurt business. Well, Desmond Tutu has a great quote. He says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. In case you're missing the analogy here, the elephant is Silicon Valley and we are the mouse. So why aren't we regulating? Why aren't we saying no to these corporations? Could it possibly be that the very people that we've chosen, not elected, to represent our rights, like Neely Kreuz, uh, past European commissioner, are acting like cheerleaders for startups, are acting like cheerleaders for Silicon Valley, as Dutch special envoy for startups now, for example. Could it be that the people that we've chosen who should be protecting our rights say things like, if you care about net neutrality, you are like the Taliban, like Günther Oettinger, who is the uh, current person in charge of digital policy. And he's also the man that uh, we can all thank for ruining net neutrality in Europe. But don't worry, you will get free roaming that is exactly how it was announced. All of the announcements were, you're going to have free roaming in Europe, isn't it great? And we're also protecting net neutrality. And we're also protecting net neutrality, and we fuck net neutrality up, basically, by creating specialized uh, services that can be treated differently. Now, does this have anything to do with the fact that Mr. Oettinger has met almost entirely with corporate lobby groups from the telecommunications industry in all of his official meetings. That red ring, his donut that he has over there, are all meetings with corporate lobbyists, most of whom are telecommunications companies. Who does the death of net neutrality benefit the most? Telecommunications companies. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. So we call these things public-private partnerships. We call them multi-stakeholderism. You might hear these terms. We call it co-regulation. So we say to Google, for example, hey Google, we want to know what um, laws to pass or how we should regulate you on privacy. So do you want to come to the table and tell us how we should do that? And they go, sure, yeah, we have a few ideas about laws for privacy and, and how that should work. Sure, we'll, we'll come to the table. We'll even pay for the table. Don't worry about it. So we call that co-regulation. But it's time that we understood that all of these terms actually mean one thing, and we should call an apple an apple. This is institutional corruption. The influence of corporate finance in public policymaking. This is why we can't regulate because we're institutionally corrupt. And with secret trade deals, like the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, or TPP, which is already in the process of passing, this is going to be the signature that signs away our democracies forever, unless we can stop them. Because these agreements have clauses inside them called Investor State Dispute Settlement Clauses. And it sounds like something that, wants, that, that just should put you to sleep, right? Don't, wake up, it's really important. What this gives is it gives corporations the right to veto 
governments, when they take decisions that are in the interests of their citizens, but not in the interests of the investors of these corporations. It gives the corporations the right to sue governments when they protect their citizens. And corporations have already used this under trade agreements to sue Canada when they, had, when they took uh, a decision to protect people from the harms of smoking, the tobacco industry sued Canada for a couple of mil hundred million dollars. This is the transfer of power from governments to corporations. Now, you may or may not like governments, but if, it's, if we had a, per, a, a functioning democracy, a government at least should be executing the will of the people, and you have a right to determine the makeup of your government. Google doesn't give a shit what you think, right? You don't have any say in what Google does at all. Even if you're a shareholder, your shares are a different class of shares, and Eric and Sergey and Larry really couldn't care less what you think they should be doing. And no, you can't vote them out. So what we have when we have corporations having all of this control is a new feudalism. It's not a monarchy, it's a feudalism, a corporate one, a corporatocracy. The solutions have to be societal. We have to recognize that institutional corruption is at the core of the problem. Unless we can remove the influence of corporate finance in public policymaking, we cannot regulate the corporations that are eroding our human rights. How important is this? This is Larry Lessig. Apart from the man who is just my general hero in gen in, because he created Creative Commons, he's been, he gets it. He's the one who coined this term, institutional corruption. He was running for president until recently in the United States on one issue, institutional corruption. He actually said at the beginning, if I get elected president, I want to pass a law to remove corporate finance from influencing Congress, from influencing government, and then I want to resign. This is the one thing that I want to do to fix the system. And everyone said, what? You don't want power for the sake of power? We'll never vote for you, you crazy man. You just want to make a change and leave? No way. You should hold on to that. And then he said, okay, I'll hold on to it. And then they said, no, we don't want you to speak. And that was the Democratic Party. So the solutions have to be financial as well. We have to be able to support the alternatives because Silicon Valley and mainstream technology is supported by, subsidized by venture capital. And, you know, there might be some of you that think, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to think about all that money stuff. It's really important because it's at the core of the problem with surveillance capitalism. This is how it works. So let's say a chap that we know, like Mark Zuckerberg, is very young. He has an idea for this thing that he wants to build to make the world a better place. And so he creates a startup, right? And he needs money. So he goes to a venture capitalist or an angel, right? Um, and he says to the angel or to the venture capitalist, he says, look, I'm building this thing. And in the next five years, we're going to have 100 million people on there. Or maybe 500 million people. How much money will you give me today for when we sell those 100 million people or 500 million people, either to the public through an IPO or to another company in five years' time? And the venture capitalist says, okay, I'll give you 5 million today. Why? Not because they're an angel, but because they're thinking if we get 500 million people, I'll get much more money because you will be a unicorn. You'll be one of those billion dollar companies, right? Unicorns, aren't they great? We fucked up unicorns, man. I mean, you've ruined unicorns for me forever. Um, and then they shake on it, right? They go, yeah, let's do this. This is the sale. The sale, when you take venture capital, doesn't happen at the end. It happens at the very beginning. What have you sold? all of the people that will be using your product in the future. That's what you've sold from day zero, right? 
So the sale is done. What's next? Well, Mark has to make this work. So when those people actually come, he's very persuasive, and he says, come, join my network. It'll let you talk to your friends. It'll be really great. We love you. Here's a privacy dinosaur. And that's the con. And we go, yeah, Mark, that sounds great. Let's use Facebook. Let's all build Facebook. At the very beginning is the only place where we have power as individuals. If at the very beginning we tell Mark what he can do with his new startup because we know that he sold us already, then it will never get the network effects that it needs to become the platform that, get, that gets sold and that, that, that the sale completes on. If enough of us use Facebook and build Facebook or Twitter and build Twitter to the point where enough of us are on it that, they're, they're, they are, that it has network effects, then we lose our power. At that point, one person leaving makes no difference, right? So this is the con. What's next? Well, we've all joined. Facebook is very successful. So the uh, venture capitalist comes back and completes the sale, either to the public with an IPO, and everyone makes like billions, right? And we go, congratulations, you're such a great person. Will you be my friend? Uh, or it gets bought by Google, or it gets bought by Facebook, etc. In this case, Facebook does not get bought by Facebook. Um, we need an alternative to this. Because if, if the only way to build technologies that can compete is through venture capital, we're just playing into the same system. We've already sold, we have no control. We can't build things, really, that protect human rights in the long term. We must fund the alternatives. Because we also can't be sponsored by these companies. Because Facebook and Google will sponsor companies to make them look good, right? Do you know that, you, you, have you heard of a little company uh, organization called Mozilla? Anyone? Yeah, Firefox? Oh, some of you know them. Did you know that until recently, they got over 90% of their money from Google, and now they get it from Yahoo? Do you know how Google and Yahoo make their money? By selling you. So. It's very interesting to look at that, to think about that, and then think about what products Mozilla makes. They make a browser, it's really cool, they make things. And what is the product that threatens Google that they make, really? And what is the product that threatens Yahoo that they make, really, while taking 270 million of their money? Why aren't they making that with 270 million? Does money have any influence? If I'm paying ni over 90% of your salary, do I have any influence in what you do at all? Even if it's not direct, do you want to piss me off? Maybe not. We have to fund the alternatives. We cannot be sponsored by the people that we're revolting against, by the corporations that we're revolting against. There has to be an alternative to evil, greedy corporation on one side and a charity or a not-for-profit. We need an alternative so that when people are coming into this industry, we don't just tell them, oh, either you go work at an evil, greedy corporation or here's a not-for-profit that you can work at. How about we build social enterprises where people can build things and, and, and that can compete, but we need to fund those. So the solutions can be technological, but it's not a matter of just throwing more technology at the problem. We need to change the character of our technologies, and that's where design comes into it. And when I say design, I'm not talking about aesthetics. I'm not talking about painting pretty pictures. I'm not talking about pixel pushing, right? This is not about saying to someone, come and make it pretty. It's not about pretty at all. If this is how you think about design, stop thinking about design that way. It's not how design works. Design is about how something works, how convenient it is, and then how delightful, how accessible it is, and then how beautiful. All of these things matter, but it's a holistic aspect. So let's look at design. Let's look at how design happens in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley creates products that empower us in the here and now really well. They create great experiences. If I use Google Mail, uh, sorry, Google Maps, let's say, and I get to where I want to go, that's empowered me right now. What's the cost? The cost 
is that I am being spied on. The cost is that Google knows where I'm going and uses that information for its own interests, possibly against my own interests. So this is Silicon Valley design. It is design without ethics. It is purely manipulation for their own purposes. I don't call this design. This is decoration. Decoration makes inequality and the status quo palatable. Design alters it. So if you want to know what Silicon Valley design is about, there's a beautiful book by Nir Eyal. It's called Hooked. Isn't it beautiful? There's a brain with a mouse button, on, like with a mouse cursor on it. Um, and the, the, ta the, the subtitle is How to Build Habit-Forming Products, right? It's a whole book about how to get people addicted to the things that we're building. After all, we call them users, right? What a terrible term. There are only two industries that call the people that use their products users. One are drug dealers, and the second are us. Let's stop this. These are not, pe these are not users. They're not the other. They're people. Let's not forget that the people who use our products are people first. Because this is all about you being the lab rat, you being what is studied, right? How do we, how do we addict you? How do we learn your behaviors so that we can build things that make you act in certain ways? When you, when you use Facebook, Facebook designs, Facebook always keeps improving Facebook, right? Right? They keep, huh, all right, someone's laughing, improving, okay, uh, air quotes. Facebook keeps improving Facebook. Why do they do that? Is it for your purposes? No. When Facebook improves its products, it's like the massage that you give to Kobe beef, right? It's not to make the cow happier. It's to make the cow a better product. So when Facebook makes its products and, 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 and has the features in there, it's to make you use it. You're like, you're like on a little treadmill. The more you run, the more they get from you that they need. So I call this evil. <laughs> or, in Silicon Valley, it's the book everyone is talking about. So that's Silicon Valley. How do we combat this? Is it free and open source design? Yeah? Do we have free and open source design? We do. It looks something like this. In the free and open source world, we build things that protect your human rights. We build things that protect freedom. We build things that protect democracy in the long term. What about right now when I want to use it? Well, pull requests are welcome. We can't keep doing this, people. It's arrogant. Remember that thing about experiences at the very beginning of the talk because of the projector? Experiences matter. We cannot disrespect people's experiences because the cost becomes convenience and the immediate experience. And what happens? Nobody uses it, right? And we can't fix this unless we change the mainstream. If you always want to be the alternative, if you get your identity from fighting against the system, I understand that. And, and you're probably doing some very valuable work there. But if you fear that you're going to lose your identity if we actually succeed in what we're trying to do, there's a problem. Think about that. I call this trickle-down technology. We feel that if we design things for ourselves that fit our needs, don't get me wrong, free and open source products work perfectly. You might not hear that all the time for us. They don't work perfectly for everyday people who just want an everyday thing that they can use without thinking about it. They don't work perfectly for non-enthusiasts. Think about this. Let's say that you have, you have three cars, three vehicles that you drive in your life. One of those cars is a classic car, and it's your hobby, and it's beautiful, but it breaks down every now and then, and you built it yourself. And every time it breaks, you're happy. Because it means you get to spend the weekend working on your classic car. That's you in your role as enthusiast, right? 
Let's say you have a car you drive to work every day. That car's purpose is to get you to work and back. That car breaks down, you're pissed off. You just want that car to work. That's you in your role as someone who uses an everyday thing for an everyday purpose. And then let's say you have a truck that you drive for work. You carry things around, you deliver things for work. You didn't buy the truck. You had no decision-making powers in uh, which model it was. Maybe it's a terrible truck, but you drive it every day. That's enterprise software, right? Um, <laughs> But it's still you. Do you see how this is not about identities? It's not about a geek versus a dumb user. It's still you, same person, three different roles, three different expectations. We're building things that really work for the classic car, right? We're building great classic cars, and we love, love breaking them apart. We're doing a shit job at building the car you drive to work every day. We're building tanks for people and telling them, why don't you learn how to use a tank when all they want is a car? We need to start building cars because this doesn't work. We build stuff for ourselves and then we somehow magically feel that it will trickle down and be useful for everyday people. This is trickle down technology. And just like trickle down economics, it doesn't work. There is no trickle. So what can we do? We don't want to be Silicon Valley. We really need to get away from where we are in free and open source in terms of our view towards design. How about ethical design? How would ethical design look? How about we create things that are great experiences in the here and now, like beautiful, beautiful experiences that empower you? but that don't erode your human rights in the future, that protect your human rights also. What's the cost? There's always a cost. Maybe it's money, people pay for it. Maybe it's taxes. We need to find a way to make these sustainable as well. We must build sustainable, independent social enterprises, the organizations that can create these products. So yesterday, two days ago now, two days ago, we launched the ethical design manifesto. And I want to take you through this because we need a framework for thinking about it. And it's based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At its very core, we have to build products that are decentralized, private, open, interoperable, accessible, secure, and sustainable. In other words, that respect human rights. But we can't stop there. Nor can we say this is the only important thing, which is sometimes what we do in free and open source. The next level, we have to build products that respect human effort, that are functional and reliable and convenient. But let's not stop there. Let's also respect the human experience and build things that are delightful. These are not separate products, each layer. Everything that we build has to be a cross-section of this pyramid. And that is ethical design. And this is where we fail in mainstream technology, in Silicon Valley. We're building things that don't respect human rights. And when you do that, you're not building things for people. You are building things on the backs of people. And that's how mainstream technologies are built. So, we just released the Ethical Design Manifesto. You can see it at indie forward slash ethical design. The URL is up there. I would urge you to consider it, to consider signing up to this way of creating tools that not only protect people's freedoms, but are a joy to use. And there are even little badges that you can put on your open source project sites as well, pre-made for you if you want to show your support for it. Because design is not what designers do. Design is what we all do. Everyone in this room is a designer. Whether you understand that, you know that or not. The moment we understand that, then we can make an effort to becoming better designers. And what's indie? 
Well, I don't just go around and talk about this stuff as theory. Um, I'm actually doing something about it as well. Not just me. It's a very scary photo of me. I'm terrible in photos when I'm posing. Um, but we're three people. We're a tiny social enterprise. We don't have any equity. We are limited which is a spe special type of organization in the UK where we don't have ownership, we only have control. So we can't be sold. And we're building... Actually, could I have some... Uh, is the audio on? I'm building a messaging application. Initially for starting with Mac OS X and then on iOS that is peer-to-peer -peer, where you can talk to people without having us listen to you. But, and I'm very proud of the UI as well, like the user interface is really beautiful, it's really nice, but when I first announced it in Malmö about a month and a half ago or so, this is how I announced it. I'm not going to play the whole thing. To just really appreciate this demonstration of the user interface, okay? To really, really appreciate the care that went into it. And in order to do that, I want you to pay extreme attention to it, okay? So to do that, please close your eyes. All of you, please. This is the amazing user interface that I'm so proud of. Could I have some audio, please? Could I not have some audio? It's so good, isn't it? It's, it's silence is such an important thing in life. Let's take that again. All right. We ready for audio? Yeah? We all good? Let's try it again. And no audio. Right. So for future reference, this is why you don't unplug the presentation machine five minutes before the presentation. Um, the audio is plugged in, so I don't know why that's not working. Nope. All right, no audio. Here's what you would have heard. <laughs> you would have heard voiceover in reading out the whole user interface as the person using it was using it. Um, a lot of work went into that that you couldn't hear, that bit that you couldn't hear. A lot of work went into this presentation um, because I respect your time. Um, and I think it's really important that we, we understand the knockoff effects of not having that respect as well. Um, so a lot of work went into making it entirely accessible. And I, it's very important that we understand the importance of that in the things that... Sorry, without hearing it, of course, it's entire bullshit right now. Um, so it's not because it was not beautiful to begin with. Um, it is a um, Again, you can't really see it very well on this projector, but take my word for it, it looks great on my screen. Um, and it's a very simple experience to get started. And that's really important. You know, it's not just about having private conversations with people, it's a usable, convenient, beautiful experience. This is what we need to aim for. Because if we don't, if nobody uses it, it doesn't matter how much it protects you, how private it is. It just doesn't matter. So, and it's still pre-alpha. This is pre-alpha. We have a huge way to go until beta right now. So in closing, here's my five-step plan for avoiding a future that's a feudalism. One, we need to understand the true nature of data and technology, and we need to create laws that protect our human rights, and we need to regulate. To do that, we must remove the influence of corporate finance in public decision-making so that we can regulate those corporations that violate our human rights. I call them people farmers. That's the business that Facebook and Google are in. They farm us. And we have to fund the alternatives. We can't use venture capital in what we're doing because we should be building organizations that don't get sold. My friend Peldi, who runs Balsamic, the mock-up tool, we were talking once and I asked him, so what's your exit strategy? Because that's a very important question in Silicon Valley. And he gave me the best answer. He said, 
my exit strategy is that my son inherits the company or that my daughter inherits the company. That should be our focus in the things that we build. And we can't do that with venture capital if we sell from day zero. And we need to create independent technologies that adhere to ethical design in what we do so we can nurture a healthy commons, a sustainable commons. This all goes back to creating a much more equal world. And this is why it's so important. I mean, when we think about things like diversity, for example, you know, who here thinks diversity is important? Who here thinks that uh, it's overrated? People are talking a lot about diversity these days, politically correct bastards. Yeah, some of you, there you go. Brave people, thank you for putting your hands up. Diversity is not charity. The reason we absolutely need diversity is because it is competitive advantage. If you think about design, there are two ways that you can do design. You can design for the other, or you can design for yourself. If you're designing for the other, you're always at a disadvantage, right? You have to first study the other. You have to understand the other. It's ethnographic. It's imperialist. What about if you're designing for yourself? Well, you probably know yourself way better if you're making something for yourself that you can use. But we have a problem. I'm a young white guy. I can design things for young white guys like me. But that's not going to... That's not going to fix the problem. So how do I design for a diverse population without designing for the other? Well, I make my organization diverse. If I can make my team diverse, then by designing for ourselves, we are designing for a diverse audience. And then you can't compete with us either. So it's not charity. It is part of the core problem. If the core problem you're trying to fix is not inequality, then we're not trying to fix the same problem. And to do that, we have to go beyond the clouds. We need a new topology for the things that we're building. Without privileged centers, privilege is the problem. It has to be egalitarian, a decentralized topology. So that when Facebook says to share your photo, you must share it with me first, we say, no, that's not required, nope. You can just share your photo with your friend. We need to move beyond centralization, centralization of power, centralization of knowledge, centralization of Do that without moving beyond venture capital in funding the things that we build. Let's, at the very least, stop worshipping at the altar of Silicon Valley. And we have to move beyond colonialism and imperialism in the way that we approach the audiences that we build for. It's a very small step from user to dumb user. And that step will always exist if we see the user as the other. We gotta start designing for ourselves. And to do that, we need to create diverse organizations. We have to move beyond privilege. This has been a very long process for me Many of us in this room have very high levels of privilege. We need to understand what that means for the world, how it affects inequality, and move beyond it. I think the only legitimate use of privilege is to use it to create a world where you would not have had it to begin with. And that's what I try to do. Because the core problem is inequality. We need to move beyond inequality. Because what it really means is we need to move beyond bullshit. Because here's what we've done. We have taken a bullshit seed and we've planted it. And we have gotten a bullshit tree. And then we climbed up into the branches and now we're asking, <clears throat> we're asking ourselves, why does the fruit taste like bullshit? Well, there's a reason for that, because it's the only type of fruit you can get from a bullshit tree. Now, some of us who see the problem, but who benefit from the system, feel that if they decorate the tree, that it will mask the taste of the fruit. But it doesn't. 
Some of us that see the problem and want to fix it feel that if we prune some of the branches, it will change the nature of the tree. But it doesn't. So here's what I think we need to do. Some of us, not all of us, have to climb down from the bullshit tree and walk a few steps to one side and plant a new seed, a seed based on equality, based on diversity, based on reason, on freedom and openness and democracy. And then we will get a very different type of tree, one that we won't need to decorate because it will have been designed to be beautiful based on these tenets. And the fruit that we get from it will be diverse. But we can't stop there. The most important step is the step after that. We must build a bridge between the bullshit tree and our tree, a convenient bridge so that those who want to join us have an easy way to do it, a convenient way to do it. That's key. If we're ever going to change the mainstream, that bridge is key because that is the bridge between the centralized world of old and the decentralized world that we must build. A world built on reason, built on equality, built on human rights and on democracy. That's the future that we deserve. That's the future that I want to live in. And that's the future that I challenge us to create. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to ask questions. I'm here for the, uh, for the whole event. I yes. don't bite hard. Um, so just come by and say hi. Yeah, feel free to find him in the uh, fest and talk to him personally. All right, thank so, you very much. And another for... round of applause for the organizers, please. They're <laughs> doing their best. They really are. Thank you. <laughs>